Hello, I'm Margaret Scott with the New York Southeast Asian Network, and I don't know how many of you have joined us, but thank you for doing so. Uh, we're having a very exciting uh, book talk today, but I just want to make just two announcements and a thank you uh, to Ms. Pool for putting this together, our coordinator of the New York Southeast Asian Network, and anybody who's watching Please subscribe to our newsletter and become a member. It's good for the organization and you'll get a lot out of it too. The events that are coming up on the <clears throat> 21st, uh, we have a, a very interesting program in the upcoming elections in Thailand. Uh, then on, that's the 22nd, sorry. The 21st is uh, Elliot Tess Freeman is going to be speaking about Rohingya and camps and uh, sort of an overall look at Myanmar these days, the ever ending, never ending tragedy. Uh, and then we have a, a very interesting program that will be up at Columbia, our partner on um, the Center for Khmer Studies is going to be doing a, a, a wonderful introduction on all the work they do. Uh, so, but today we are extremely lucky. Uh, we published last year, Mobilizing for Elections, Patronage, and Political Machines in Southeast Asia was a long-term project by four unbelievably uh, brilliant Southeast Asian scholars. And I'm going to introduce them very, very briefly. Alan Hicken sadly had to join us by Zoom because he's teaching today, and he's a professor of political science at the University of Michigan. Uh, and he's published many, many books, and he's involved in many centers. Uh, his work focuses on political institutions, political economy, uh, policymaking, with a special focus on Southeast Asia. And he's written about all the countries that we are going to be discussing today. Then we're going to start off with Paul Hutchcraft, who's on my right left. And he is a scholar of comparative and Southeast Asian politics. He's at the um, university. ANU, Australian National University, and we have some people coming in. Please join us and welcome. Uh, and he's also written many books. He's now at the Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs. For uh, a number of years, he was on the Khan route to 2013 to 2017 in the Philippines, where he is a, a particularly well-versed scholar. Uh, next, we have uh, Ed Aspinall, Edward Aspinall, who is the head of the Department of Political and Social Change at the Goro Bell School of Asian Pacific Affairs at Australian National University. He's written four books and co-edited many more, and um, he knows just about everything to do with Indonesia and more broadly Southeast Asia. Uh, and last but not least is Meredith Weiss. She's the professor of political science of political science at Rockford College of Public Affairs and Policy at the University of Albany, part of the SUNY system. Her uh, <clears throat> particular expertise is on Malaysia, but she also is a Southeast Asianist and has written many, many books, which you can look up if you want. <laughs> and read them, read each one of them. And with that, I'm going to turn you over to Paul. Thank you very much, Margaret. And on behalf of all of us, uh, Thanks very much to you and the uh, uh, New York South Decision Network and yeah, for uh, uh, organizing that. Great honor to be able to present uh, some of the key ideas from our uh, recent book. Uh, and just to say a word about the, the larger project um, that uh, it culminated in this volume, Mobilizing for Elections, Patronage and Political Machines in Southeast Asia, which came out with Cambridge <coughs> University Press last year. Um, all four of us are, are uh, avid observers of electoral politics in our uh, major countries of specialization. Uh, Ed, Indonesia, uh, Meredith, uh, Malaysia, um, Alan, uh, Thailand, with also very significant work in the Philippines, and then my work uh, on the Philippines. So it was hard for us to ignore uh, money politics and patronage, but also as scholars of comparative politics, um, certainly in my own teaching of comparative politics, I was always struck at how the term money politics means very different places from one national context to, to another, uh, so that its meaning in the Philippines is not uh, quite the same as that in uh, Malaysia and not quite the same as Japan, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So all of this led us into this uh, inquiry, uh, and um, 
uh, Alan had written uh, already quite significantly on uh, clientelism and building party systems. Uh, I had uh, interrogated uh, what I found the faulty uh, conflation of patronage and clientelism, uh, and um, that served as uh, one of the founding foundation, one of the core foundations of our, our theoretical framework. So all, all of that led us into this uh, project that um, culminated uh, in um, this volume, uh, Mobilizing for Elections, um, that came out, as I said, last year. So um, we uh, begin by wanting to better understand uh, this term, money politics, uh, which is ubiquitous uh, and uh, not necessarily fully accepted. As you can see, the photo on the left, reject money politics from Malaysia, and obviously something uh, on the right that puts it in quite pejorative terms uh, in the Philippines. Shall I move this? The, the, uh, will they maybe just cancel out? That one up there. So yeah. So it's yeah, let me get close so, 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 so we can see this recording. recording. So it's visible to everybody. And, and then yeah. Great. So hopefully that's a little more visible. So we're under, we're interested in understanding this both from the uh, uh, perspective of of the voter uh, and also of political uh, candidates and where they are important political parties as well. Uh, what are the dynamics of uh, the exchange of uh, money and um, uh, patronage resources more, more generally uh, during and uh, also between uh, elections. Uh, and so we're, we're focusing on these three countries and we begin with a basic distinction between patronage and clientelism. This is a term that is often uh, conflated in the literature, but we want to untangle these things and highlight that patronage is a material resource uh, generally, but not uh, always from public uh, sources um, that is used for party or political advantage. Clientelism, on the other hand, is a per personalistic relationship of power. Here we go back to the classic patron-client literature of uh, James Scott and others, uh, enduring multipurpose, face-to-face uh, -face, um, relationship. Uh, and then we point out that not all patronage is clientelistic, as much patronage is not personalistic. Uh, similarly, not all clientelism is patronage, that is used for party or political advantage. Uh, because you can think of the classic patron-client relation of, of landlord and tenant, and that may or may not um, have an important role in the uh, political sphere. So. Uh, we start with that uh, and uh, trying to understand this, but we also go beyond a lot of the literature that focuses quite narrowly, in our view, on just the relationship between candidates and voters, because we think it's important to look at the whole ecosystem uh, of politicians uh, at the local level as they uh, articulate with those at the provincial and or state level onwards uh, at the at the national level. So we're looking at it in a much broader perspective, I think, than a lot of the uh, literature does. Uh, so, um, see if I can get this thing to, to click downward. I might not need to put the mouse back. Oh, I see. Very good. Okay. So the goals of our project, uh, we start off with, with five different questions. Um, the first two are, are very straightforward and careful questions. And that is, what is the, what are the types of patronage that we find? Uh, now, this is not only the money that gets exchanged in uh, um, quote unquote vote buying at election time, uh, but also uh, pork barrel, also a, the uh, uh, spoil system, a range of, of different uh, elements of, of patronage. Then we want to look at the, the networks um, through which patronage is distributed, and we'll be saying uh, more about that later. Then in the, our third question, how do the network, the types of patronage and the networks come together? And out of this comes our uh, basic concept of electoral mobilization regimes. We find different electoral mobilization regimes across our three countries. Then our, our fourth question uh, looks at how, this, how the distinctive patterns of uh, patronage actually works. Uh, how and to what extent do they influence voters? And as 
we'll be getting to later in our talk, um, we go against, um, we have some contrarian views relative to uh, much of the literature in this regard as well. And then finally, we need an explanation. What explains the patterns we observe both across and within countries? And here we start with, but go beyond a historical institutional perspective. Uh, and we'll be getting into that in a little bit as well. So, um, of course, we build on this literature that goes back uh, now almost or, uh, 50 to 60 years. Carl Lunde's work on patron client networks in the Philippines, James Scott, uh, who extended it across. Um, Southeast Asia. Uh, but then interest in uh, clientelism and patronage uh, has been a major focus in other areas as well, from Japan to India to Africa to Latin America. Um, so we are interested in all of um, building on all of that literature as well, but refocusing attention. Let's go back to Southeast Asia, and I think everyone here at the New York Southeast Asia Network would, would find that a, a worthy goal. Let's go back to Southeast Asia uh, while also contributing to larger comparative debates. So um, as I alluded to earlier, we have three primary countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines, three secondary cases, Thailand, Singapore, and Timor-Leste. We had collaborators uh, in each of these countries, including um, universities, uh, one uh, major university collaborator each in Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, and the Philippines. And we had a, we had a beautiful um, royal flush, uh, if you will, uh, all set up. Uh, Malaysia 2013, uh, then it was Indonesia uh, 2014, then Thailand 2015, we hoped. Uh, and then Philippines 2016. So we're going to uh, look at all of these countries. The, the uh, calendar seemed to line up, line up perfectly, um, but um, alas, there was that military coup in 2014 in Thailand. So thanks to the generals, um, we could not have Thailand as a primary case, and it became relegated, uh, relegated to a secondary case. So just a brief word about our methods. Um, we engaged in what we call extensive ethnographic research. Um, we had uh, very significant teams, around 50 researchers in each country, and we set them out to be shadowing candidates, conducting interviews, observing election uh, events. Um, I think we estimated that we, there, there's something like 3,000 interviews uh, in all that went into uh, this project. Uh, we also traveled uh, as the four of us throughout each country. Um, I had to step away from the project, as Margaret uh, had men mentioned. I worked in um, the Philippines for the uh, Australian Aid Program as government specialist from 23 to uh, 2013 to 2017. Um, so I missed a lot of the fun in um, uh, Indonesia in, in particular. Um, but um, we did get around to um, uh, the four countries, uh, three countries, the four of us, and uh, had a number of uh, additional interviews and focus group discussions as part of the project as well. Also, very importantly, the extensive ethnographic research was uh, complemented by surveys, including survey experiments um, and um, surveys of local brokers and voters using uh, vote buying lists. So. Um, this has been a uh, quite a productive collaboration and all with um, uh, edited volume on Malaysia and then another one to go with it on uh, the Sarawak election, then uh, edited volume on Indonesia translated into Indonesian and then a special issue on the local elections, Kolkata in Indonesia in 2017, um, edited volume on the Philippines and then um, as part of my work in the, uh, the uh, aid program. Um, I uh, edited a volume on electoral system redesign in the Philippines, and all of this doesn't even include another book that uh, Ed co-authored with uh, Ward, Ward Berenschot, uh, Cornell Press on clientelism in Indonesia. So um, there were also PhD dissertations, uh, lots of journal articles that came out of all of this. So these were, these were the, the uh, outputs that we had along the way, um, but it um, all culminated in the volume that we are discussing today, in which we're trying to tie together 
a lot of the uh, comparative and theoretical insights into the one uh, volume. Uh, so now I will turn it over to Ed. Thanks very much, uh, everyone. So here are some of the contributions that we hope uh, to make <laughs> through the volume. In the first place, we, we show how patterns of patronage, so the forms of patronage that are distributed and the sort of networks that politicians use to, uh, to distribute uh, patronage uh, are, are mutually constitutive. So we see these sort of clumping together of particular patterns of patronage distribution with particular network forms. We analyze how these different uh, uh, electoral mobilization regimes, as we call them, uh, arise as a result of long-term patterns of state building, party development, uh, and the development of political institutions. So to, we show how these combine to produce coherent, self-sustaining patterns and systems for patronage. We challenge a lot of the contemporary literature on the understanding of the meaning of and the motives behind this form of uh, political mobilization. We distinguish amongst types of patronage, and we'll be talking about that in a moment. We explore the ways in which patronage politics interact with identity uh, and group politics of various kinds. And we explore how and why patterns of patronage politics vary within countries. Now, we'll just focus on some of these highlights in our um, uh, presentation today, but happy to touch on any of them. So just to summarise our sort of core idea uh, in this paper, in, in our book, is the idea of electoral mobilisation regimes. So this is this idea that the forms of patronage that are distributed and the networks through which uh, uh, that distribution occurs clump together in these distinctive patterns. And you can see along the top um, the description of the different, the distinctive national patterns of uh, networks used for the distribution of patronage, with party machines in Malaysia, local machines in the Philippines, and ad hoc teams in Indonesia. Then if you look down uh, the left-hand column uh, and the, the gray bands uh, horizontally down the, down the table, you can see three major patterns or three major forms of patronage uh, which we distinguish. So, and these really refer to different scales of distribution. So micro uh, uh, patronage or micro particularism refers to the distribution of money, goods, and services to individual voters and household uh, in hopes of exchanging their electoral support, generally but not exclusively at election time. So this, of course, is, incorporates the most uh, famous uh, example of this form of patronage, the distribution of cash, or usually called vote buying. Um, MISO uh, particularism involves distribution of patronage to groups and communities, commonly referred to uh, pork or club, pork barrel politics or club goods. So this is aid, for example, for communities to repair or build roads or other community uh, facility, facilities, assistance to groups, uh, fund their activities or fund um, the equipment or other facilities that they need. Whereas macro particularism in our analysis refers to the hijacking of ostensibly programmatic policies. So these are policies that are distributed on a, on a national or perhaps a province-wide scale and are supposed to be distributed without any sort of political favoritism. Uh, but macro particularism therefore refers to the forms of hijacking um, by politicians of that distribution. And again, just to emphasize our core sort of point here, that the distinctive patterns of uh, patronage distribution uh, that we see in each of the major columns uh, and coinciding with the different network forms we see summarized at the top, we see these uh, combinations as being very much uh, mutually constitutive and uh, acting a, a clumping together according to distinctive political logics. Let me just briefly go through each of the four, uh, each of the three distinctive forms of network that we identify uh, through the book. And I should stress that we do also emphasize a lot of um, uh, exceptions to these rules uh, uh, within country. Uh, we'll come back to that later. So, but in Malaysia, uh, campaigns 
political campaigns revolve primarily around parties. This is overwhelmingly national parties on the peninsula and in East Malaysia, so Sabah Sarawak, are both national and state-based party. Campaign teams are composed largely of party loyal loyalists, including members of affiliated youth and women's organisations, and the individuals who are involved in election campaigning in Malaysia, uh, therefore can hope to build um, lifelong careers through these political parties. So we expect a generally much higher degree of political loyalty uh, in Malaysia than in the two other cases. And because these parties, especially in the case of the long governing, long, um, the very resilient governing parties that were part of the national and, and uh, state-based coalitions, uh, were in power for very long periods of time, the primary sources of resources uh, for their patronage distribution are from the state. So we see a big emphasis, for example, on um, pork barrel politics, miso particularism, as well as the hijacking of national um, of uh, national programs, so macro particularism um, in Malaysia, with parties coordinating much of this distribution. We see here and there, we see spots of micro particularism, vote buying and so on, but comparatively little targeting of individuals and households uh, compared to our other country cases. Indonesia is almost at the opposite end of the spectrum. Here we see campaign um, teams that are largely, to a large extent, assembled by individual candidates rather than being coordinated through large parties. So each candidate typically assembles an ad hoc, unique campaign team that's often called a team success or a success team. Um, and to build these teams, candidates usually draw on family, business, associational or other links. So they'll begin by uh, targeting their electoral district, uh, calling upon a few close associates, pointing them as, say, sub-district coordinators. Those sub-district coordinators will then recruit through their own personal networks, then recruit through their own personal networks. So you can get these massive um, uh, teams of sometimes thousands of vote brokers, um, all working for an individual uh, candidate. Um, uh, very often, um, candidates are forced to rely on um, pretty much people who are guns uh, for hire, and you can see why. Um, these are people who uh, are often motivated by the material or other benefits they can get through participation in the, in the team. And because they're recruited through these layers of brokers, they often don't have many personal connections uh, to the candidate themselves. Um, uh, uh, these workers or, or, or brokers uh, in these teams then identify voters who the bid to vote for the candidate. Uh, they'll collect their names, distribute that list of names up through this pyramid, and then the money or other goods are distributed back down through the uh, pyramid, distributed to individual voters. It's like a classic client's uh, pyramid. And importantly, when we compare them to the other two countries, which are our major foci, uh, these organisations tend to be temporary. They dissolve after an election. And part of the reason for this uh, is that precisely because these are individual efforts. They're assembled by individual candidates. And as you can imagine, assembling an individual, a team like this, consisting of thousands of people, distributing massive amounts of patronage, are uh, highly expensive events. Candidates often go into um, personal debt uh, in order to fund these campaigns. So therefore, we see a lot of disillusion of these teams uh, after election. And part of the reason for this, which we explain uh, in the volume, is that Indonesian um, uh, political candidates are just much more, much less successful at accessing long-term sources and reliable patronage from within the state than their um, uh, or their um, uh, um, counterparts, thank you, uh, their counterparts uh, in uh, Malaysia and the Philippines, and parties play a much lesser role in terms of coordinating access uh, amongst individuals uh, that uh, patronage. Uh, the next, our next sister, and that's uh, sort of um, uh, ideal type uh, of, um, uh, of electoral mobilization machine are those based, are those in the Philippines. Uh, where politics is characterised by this 
massive role played by local physical machines. These are often branded with their own team name and logo, um, and this is the dominant political for, form of political organisation at the local level uh, in the Philippines. Some, a lot of similarities with the Indonesian model, these machines are usually centred around a locally powerful politician and his or her family, that, but they extend before this family for via personal or clientelistic relationships to incorporate layers of brokers or leaders who do the candidate's campaign work. They tend to be headed by mayors and governors. But if you look at the form of the machine, it, it resembles, um, at least in its sort of pyramidal structure, that which we observe uh, in Indonesia. But unlike in Indonesia, these machines continue to function as patronage distribution networks between elections and endure from uh, election to election. And this is largely because they're built around the capture of local power um, at the local level uh, by the, the individual politicians and the families uh, that control them. They're built up over time and much more enduring, and therefore they have fewer guns for hire um, and stronger tiles of loyalty among their members than we do than we see in the Indonesian examples. Um, Local machines then usually ally or form coalitions with national parties um, at a, for general elections, but they remain uh, uh, distinct. Why the differences? Um, here, in order to explain how and why the <coughs> forms of patronage machines evolve in each of these countries, we really look at the long historical sweep and the historical development of uh, the state, of political parties, of electoral systems, and of bureaucracy. So we observe when and how elections and parties developed, when and how did a strong state bureaucracy develop, um, and what the extent is for cooperation and coordination that arise from these uh, uh, patterns of sequencing. Um, importantly, in the in Sorry, I'm getting confused amongst the <laughs> screens here. Um, so in Malaysia, we, we find the development of a strong and autonomous, a relatively autonomous bureaucracy first, uh, later a strong party capturing power um, and using its domination and its, um, its control of national political power in order to organise access to patronage for the long term. Um, so we have strong incentive for coordination, therefore, amongst politicians. In the Philippines, we get this early development of elections during the first part of the 20th century, during the US uh, period, um, and local political power, therefore, being captured by families with strong bases in the provinces um, prior to the establishment of or the building up of a strong, effective and autonomous uh, bureaucracy. So we get incentives for coordination, but very much at the level of these locally dominant uh, party, uh, oh, sorry, machines. In, in the Indonesian case, we get quite a different story with a strong authoritarian regime dominating politics uh, for three decades between the 1960s and the 1990s. It was very much a patronage system, a system in which patronage was coordinated and distributed through the bureaucracy in which political parties played very little role. And this legacy still continues to limit uh, the access that uh, elected politicians have to, uh, to resources. Uh, and therefore, we see weak incentives for, for coordination. I should add that part of the picture here uh, is also constituted by the choices that these countries make in their electoral systems. In Indonesia, we've had these choices of very much uh, candidate centered electoral systems, which also undercut coordination, uh, incentives for coordination amongst, uh, uh, amongst politicians. So I'll hand over to Meredith. Uh, well, I get to do the juggling participant. Okay. Okay, so um, I will, I'll go through this part um, fairly quickly, just uh, to make sure we stay on time. But um, so we spend a lot of the book talking about microparticularism, and that's the handouts to voters or families. So that can be pretty much anything. It can be bags of rice, packages of noodles. We had candidates who talked about that they use the high quality instant noodles rather than the cheapo ones, um, prayer mats, different sorts of services, legal services, and so forth, or just plain old cash. And again, this can be for individuals or um, or households, um, and um, 
Oh, you know what? I'm, I'm on the wrong. Uh, that, that's a slide. Um, and the, the, these can be for individuals or households. Mostly these are during the campaign, but sometimes they might be at other points. This type of particularism of patronage is ubiquitous in Indonesia and the Philippines. It's less common in Peninsular Malaysia, but it's more so in East Malaysia and Sabah and Sarawak. This is a type of money politics of patronage that gets a lot of press and a lot of condemnation as being illegal, nobody likes it, everybody does it. Um, but there's very little social stigma we found attached to this practice or these practices in the countries we studied. So we found uh, candidates and campaign teams in Indonesia and the Philippines quite happy actually to talk very specifically about how they fold the cash that they're distributing and things like that. Um, and so that led to just a slight thing, some really fun conversations. Um, so what are these um, and, and how should we think about these handouts? So the standard view is that this is contingent, that the expectation is that I give you money, you give me a vote, um, and that there's a, a targeted process and an expectation of reciprocity that's, that's ensured by monitoring and enforcement. In other words, that there's some way of knowing whether people followed through on their agreement, implicit as it might be, to vote. Um, and so we find different forms of this practice in the literature. We find vote buying, which is that you target undecided voters with cash or other, other goods, and they then come to your side. There's turnout buying, which is that you go to the people you assume to be your core supporters, and you give them cash or other goods to ensure that they actually show up to vote. Or there's abstention buying, which is basically paying people not to vote. We did see some of all of this, but much less than we expected. And so that led us to this question of what we do find. And so we think that a lot of what other scholars tend to treat as contingency-based clientelism, as contingent, is in fact not contingent at all. And so instead, when candidates distribute patronage to voters or to groups, they're frequently engaging in things that we call, and again, I'll run through this quickly, but happy to answer questions, credibility buying, turf protection, or brand building. So these are non-contingent strategies that are common, they're rational, and they're viable. So first, brand building. Brand building is non-targeted distribution. In other words, everybody gets something that's meant to increase name recognition and signal generosity. Okay, so these efforts, they're not discriminatory. So if you go to a campaign rally, everybody there gets a free meal or everyone along the road gets a t-shirt or everyone in the neighborhood gets a bottle of water with that candidate's uh, face on it. Um, there is no real expectation we find from the candidate that those who get this handout will vote for them. You get the keychain, that's not really making you so beholden. Um, nor do recipients feel that they have any special moral or social or cultural obligation to reciprocate. The goal is really to advertise, to, to, to build the brand by distributing these things as widely as possible. And so this really does look more like political advertising rather than targeted contingent handouts. Okay, so, um, oops, wrong, wrong screen again. Okay, so um, if it's not contingent again, we then might still ask, all right, so brand building, but is that all? No, it's also what we call credibility buying. So this is going to our presumed supporters to signal viability of the candidate, that the candidate is serious and capable. So we can then see these payments as really a price of admission or an entry ticket. If you don't buy votes, if you don't make these payments, you're going to lose even if you can't be sure that you'll win if you do spend this money. And so if you are the one candidate who is not distributing largesse, who's not being generous, that's fatal. So brokers and voters judge candidates because it's also the campaign teams. They want to see that there's money going around. If, if you fail to distribute funds, they see you as not serious as a contender. Those candidates will have trouble recruiting reliable brokers, the brokers they recruit will be more likely to shirk, either to not distribute what they have or to, um, to work for other candidates. And voters will likely dismiss you altogether. So candidates, we find, are trapped in a prisoner's dilemma. They could, if they choose to be the one candidate who doesn't distribute money, they get the suckers pay off, they lose. Um, and so we have some colorful quotes, if you don't have money, you can't stand. So the minimum a candidate needs to do is provide uh, some good pocket money, that's all. Um, and the ele election is harvest time for us. This is from a voter, of course. So we take advantage of the blessings as much as we can. Okay. Um, all right, so lastly, we, we determined that part of what this money does is also turf protection. So the presumption in much of the literature on clientelism is that these voter candidate or voter party relationships 
are relatively stable and binding. That candidates can say who their core voters are, their base, um, or in Indonesia, the boxes, you know, that says who is who's your 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 um, pool of voters on whom you can rely. But we found that candidates in our countries tend to assume that even their presumed loyalists can be quite fickle and prone to defection. So ongoing clientelist relationships may persist, but there still is that worry that candidates that voters will defect. So candidate after candidate, campaign after campaign, express that same sentiment. If the loyalists aren't paid, they will cease to be loyalists. Loyalists will defect for the right price. And so we have what we call turf protection, which is targeting presumed supporters to hedge against their defection or defending their presumed supporters from poaching by rivals in an environment of weak attachment to party. And again, this is something we see less in Malaysia than in our other cases, in part because party loyalty until the last election does tend to be stronger there. Okay, so we have some, uh, again, colorful quotes here. If voters can't get cash or incentives for electoral support from one candidate politician, they will vote for the opponent who can have a better offer. It's a real competition. We give them money just to bind them so they are not pursued by others. But it is like herding goats into a holding pen. You can be sure that some will run off, tempted by the green grass over there. And my personal favorite, blood is thicker than water, but money, especially if it's a bundle of a thousand pesos, is much thicker than blood. Okay, so... That's micro. How about MISA particularism? This is the middle level. This is to a village or a community, um, local public goods, sometimes called club goods or pork. <laughs> so this is distribution of patronage to groups. Um, and this may be by geographic targeting. So the people in this one village or neighborhood, or it may be by group. So the people who are in one uh, social network, for instance. Now we see MISO particularism in all of our cases. It's very popular. It is less costly than dispensing cash or individual patronage to voters because you can target a lot of voters at once. It carries less social and legal stigma. So candidates and teams brag about this. You'll see that they put up a, not always calling it the pork barrel building, but you know, call a spade a spade. Um, but they'll tell you that this, this is the, the thing that we'll, we'll build, the, the one on the um, left, we'll build a thousand units of low cost housing that's in that area if uh, the party wins. Okay, so this is not under undercover. It allows politicians to provide benefits to voters throughout the electoral cycle, and it provides efficient monitoring by focusing on groups of voters rather than individuals. Okay, so the goals of, of uh, MISA particularism is often not contingent, um, as, as we've said, so we get the same sort of brand building, or protection, and so forth. It's contingent only where there are reliable command voters, and what we mean is if, for instance, we found in some longhouse community in uh, East Malaysia, there may be uh, the head of the longhouse who is um, who's really able to command the votes, to drive the votes of the residents therein. So that's where this sort of patronage to the longhouse can be quite effective. But otherwise, it's really, there's no really strong expectation that it'll turn out votes. Um, and the transition we have from what we call networks of effect these are networks that are organized around religious or cultural or social groups. They're about some sort of shared identity or belief. Transition from that to networks of benefit over time. So networks of benefit could be a, a trade union, but it's something that's tied to income generating or employment or other material needs. So we see a lot of farmers cooperatives or fishers cooperatives that candidates target, for instance, for this type of sort of patronage. So those networks over time in our countries increasingly rely on government officials to channel or access benefits that they need, infrastructure and so forth. And that's where we may find um, a, a shift in the ways in which patronage is distributed through those networks um, in, in delivering, for instance, a platform for fishers to use. So, um, and this may also be, for instance, mayors and barangay chiefs in the Philippines or village heads or the Erte Airway, the neighborhood association heads in, the, in Indonesia and so forth. And this then serves this MISO particularism can serve to mobilize voters, even if it's not fully contingent. Oops. Okay. So lastly, we have macro particularism, uh, which we also call hijacking. So we, it's, it is possible to, dis to distinguish between programmatic policies, those that are not based on even an assumption of contingency, and those that, that and, and policies that are really patronage targeted at groups or individuals, but that's actually a pretty blurred line. So we have in the literature these criteria for how do we know it's programmatic, um, that the 
recipients are publicly, the criteria are publicly identified, they're followed and so forth. But in practice, that can be quite hazy because of what we call hijacking. So this is sometimes not actually changing the content of the program or the way of distribution, but sometimes it's a matter of spin to make it look like a given programmatic policy is actually to the advantage of a particular party or politician. So a classic example of this would be Malaysia, this, um, this um, uh, cash distribution program um, called BRIM, the, the Bancho um, Raya Sachin Malaysia, the, the One Malaysia People's Aid. So it's programmatic. There are neutral criteria, the criteria are followed, it's just an automatic process, but politicians would have voters come to their office to pick up a check. So it looks like it's coming from the party. That's what you mean by the spin. So from the voter's perspective, the programmatic policy appears particularistic or partisan, but it may not be. So this is imputed contingency. And we, we identify here, you can see these three types of hijacking distinguished by the degree and type of discretion that the politician or candidate exercises. So the first is credit claiming. This is really just changing the character or the appearance of an, of an initiative by trying to claim credit. So for instance, this would be the, the, the cash to unconditional cash transfer program I mentioned. There is no actual discretion or very minimal, but it looks like there is. So that's claiming credit for the policy. The second has a little bit more discretion. That's facilitation. So this is when the candidate or politician connects individuals or groups of voters with resources for which they are qualified under a programmatic policy, but they may have trouble accessing. So this might be when um, the candidate or the party helps citizens apply for welfare benefits or apply for enrollment in a new healthcare initiative in Indonesia, for instance. The third has the most discretion, and that we call morselization. So this involves the carving up, actually we borrow the term from others, the carving up of public projects or programs. So they're produced and distributed for political rather than economic or programmatic criteria. So this essentially takes the programmatic good, uh, welfare services, for instance, or education funding, and turns it into micro or meso particularism. There is discretion involved. So you have education funding, we're going to carve that up into scholarships and decide who gets those scholarships. Okay. So these play out differently across our cases. Malaysia, parties have been strong. Ruling coalition has had access to the state. We've seen mostly hijacking in the form of credit claiming, uh, which favors a ruling party, and facilitation. Um, and we see that also in our secondary case of Singapore. In Indonesia, where parties are weak and legislators have less discretion to, state, to access um, state resources, opportunities to claim credit are, are more limited, though they try to. Um, and so instead, they may try to facilitate access to state provided benefits, and there's not much more solicitation just because of, again, the way that access to the state is determined. In the Philippines, we have uh, weak national parties, but strong local political machines, a lot of discretion in allocating public benefits. So here we see a lot of more solicitation and then some um, credit claiming and facilitation. All right, moving on from that, we also do have non-patronage based appeals. We're not trying to imply that everything is patronage. So in particular, at the national level, not the local level, we find that patronage and clientelism are generally less effective. It's just too expensive, might build resentment and so forth. So if we have a candidate for president, for instance, they're less likely to rely upon patronage. But also we have, for instance, programmatic policies. Again, these are ones that are just public services. For instance, with growing urbanization, we find in Malaysia greater reliance on just programmatic provision of urban infrastructure. We find normative appeals, which might be religious or ideological appeals. So the, the place of Islamist parties, for instance. We find appeals based on ethnic or regional or other identity that may not rely upon patronage. And we may find simple charisma, including a degree of populism with people like Duterte. All right. We do also note in the volume, importantly, that there are what we term islands of exception. So these are places in which there's subnational variation. So politicians might either rely more intensely on patronage than elsewhere, sometimes combined with coercion, or especially in urban areas, you may find that there's less reliance on patronage and more programmatic appeals. So we find three dimensions especially important. The first is concentration of control over economic resources. It's not just underdevelopment, it's where there are local monopolies because of the nature of economic development. So where we have 
mining or plantations or other natural resource focused industries in particular, we see these monopolies that develop, which allow the economic powerhouse to control those. So that's where we may find really specific forms of local bossism and elite political capture that and that also sometimes lends itself to coercion. Patronage can work well there. Second, where we have a different capacity of local state institutions. So where state institutions are relatively well developed, especially where there's a strong central organization that's autonomous and effective and can tamp down bosses and strongmen, uh, where the state monopolizes coercion, politicians then have more limited ability or impetus to reach beyond programmatic um, strategies toward coercion. So where the state is weak, in contrast, we may find that patronage and coercion go hand in hand. Again, this is then an island of exception. This is not the norm in any of our countries, but we do find, for instance, in parts of Mindanao, that we have a weaker reach of the central state um, and some uh, salience of coercion. <clears throat> in, 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 uh, on the other hand, where clients have little ability to choose a different patron. In other words, there's sort of single stranded patronage ties. There we find that, um, that there's little ability to turn instead to the state or to, to shift their allegiance. So the last part here then is this relative autonomy and egalitarianism of local social networks. Sorry, I gave the description before the label. So where local leaders are sufficiently powerful to, to direct the political behavior of subordinates without having to offer some immediate benefit they may be incorporated, those leaders, into local political networks in ways that don't require them to share the benefits with their clients. What that means is the candidate will give the local strong person, again, often in an area where there's a monopolistic control over the one source of employment and income in the area, they'll give them a payout. They then can make their single-stranded client networks uh, vote accordingly without um, having even to share that wealth. So the critical issue there is the relative density of civil society and the extent to which local community members can choose among networks or are tied to a single option. So regions that are marked by relative economic underdevelopment, natural resource endowment, state weakness, and strong or hierarchical social networks then give rise to patterns that are more intensely clientelistic and often also incorporate more coercion. So those would be places like Sabah and Sarawak in Malaysia, Mindanao in the Philippines, and Papua in Indonesia. By contrast, regions with relatively developed and diversified local economies, robust state capacity, and both dense and egalitarian social local civil societies offer more ground for alternatives to patronage politics. Um, and so those are often cities, and that's where we tend to see a turn away from patronage. All right, lastly, um, we talk about what we can do with all this. So our framework cannot explain everything. So for instance, the coup in Thailand, we can't explain that, that's different. Um, <clears throat> and our goal is um, to explore more um, the, this nature of, of, of turning out mobilizing voters. We don't really talk about other aspects of money politics like financing and the sources of patronage. Okay, next. Um, our goal is to present a framework and a method that can be widely used, but our three electoral mobilization regimes are not unique or exhaustive. So other countries may fit these same patterns or might suggest additional patterns. We really want to present a framework and method. So we do see some parallels and echoes. So we have party-based regimes also in Timor-Leste, in Singapore, Japan, Turkey, Mexico, mm -hmm. local machines also in Thailand, the ad hoc networks, Peru, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, and so forth. All right. We are normative um, in the implications of what we examine. And we don't see that as necessarily um, a bad thing, but what we detail, we do think to be problematic. So um, this sort of patronage and clientelism calls for some sort of policy redress, but at the same time, part of what we're arguing is that it may not be so terrible as the assumptions tend to um, project. So we find that there are rarely changed outcomes as a result of things like vote buying in Indonesia that in many ways, what we may see is redistribution of resources to voters. And there's little evidence of what uh, Susan Strokes calls perverse accountability, or politicians who hold voters accountable. But on the other hand, this sort of practice leads to inefficient and poor governance, and may incur, incur distrust and cynicism among voters, may incentivize politicians to keep the state weak in order to keep themselves useful, 
and it can be really costly, and those costs have to be recouped, which raises the specter of capture and corruption. So we do talk about policy remedies, especially in our, our final chapter, um, and we don't solve the problem. Uh, we, we argue that there are no quick fixes, that reforms are difficult to practice, potentially counterproductive when they're implemented if there are unintended consequences. So there are some possibilities, though. So electoral reform, working to strengthen parties, developing incentives for programmatic appeals may help. Reducing voters' vulnerability so they don't need to rely upon somebody who gives them what little payment. So things like the 30 baht healthcare scheme in Thailand could go far in that direction, or the Bolsa Familia scheme, which is also welfare program in Brazil. Um, bureaucratic reform and reducing discretion may remove politicians as intermediators, which may also help. We do find, importantly, that anti-vote buying campaigns are generally not effective, that there's not really much social stigma to vote buying, they, campaigns may backfire, they smack up elitism, patronizing attitudes of poor voters, uh, that if only they were better informed, they would not take money and they would be like I am. So in other words, we find that there are no quick fixes, but there are some longer term solutions that may help. On that, we will end. Thank you very much. We have a crowd online and quite a crowd in the room here. So we're going to open it up for questions. Um, and if you don't, and we're going to bring Alan in to talk a little bit about it. And Alan, on this question that you're not really prescriptive, um, that seems kind of why did you do it then? <laughs> I want to ask you to probe a little bit more because in you have a wonderful quote that uh, there's three conditions necessary for reform. And you do also make a good case that democratic governance is very much hurt by clientelism. So both I'd love to you to give us a sense of what it does to democratic governance and then to what your thoughts are on how it might yeah, so thank you. Um, and, and thank you for my uh, co colleagues and co-authors for a wonderful presentation. Um, I, um, I guess I, I, the, the, the sort of lack of, of, of sort of strong, uh, strong prescription uh, comes from this, this, this idea that these are really complex phenomena that, that um, have no single cause. Uh, we also wanted to emphasize that some of the boogeyman that are that are sort of raised up as you know he, here's the problem of, of, of these kinds of activities that it's that um, it is capturing voters in these relationships in which they can't escape uh, that it is um, depriving them of democratic choice Th that does happen but we see much less of that than than we, we imagined going in so that doesn't seem to be the problem but what we do want to acknowledge is that um, and as Meredith kind of touched on at the end there. Um, these do set up some really perverse uh, sort of incentives. So um, uh, when you think about politicians having to reap, uh, you know, reap what they sow to be being able to recoup the cost that that that, that uh, goes into this, that raises the specter of again corruption and um, uh, and capture. Uh, we worry a lot about the poor the the, the poor quality of goods. These, these things are really inefficient, right? Um, uh, I, I could spend this money in other ways that would give me more bang for the buck, uh, and um, I think the incentives for politicians to keep these things uh, contingent, to keep their discretion, uh, um, uh, is a disincentive for improving public services generally. So what we worry about is the voters become disillusioned, right? They they see politics as transactional. They see uh, voting uh, voting as what did you give to me lately, uh, and uh, which gives less room for uh, broader policies, broader ideas, and less room to hold. Uh, parties collectively accountable for policy and policy making. So, uh, and that that opens up the scope for people like a Duterte who can come in and and you know uh, promise big things and big fixes because uh, voters are are frustrated that democracy is not delivering on the promised fruits. Right. So that that is that is a concern. Um, there are some things that, that that I think we 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 all agree could be done, but they're hard to do. Right. So removing and reducing uh, politician discretion is really hard. Uh, changing electoral rules is really hard because incumbents are winning under those rules and those and those provisions, and they're the ones that have to be uh, uh, that that um, need to agree to change those rules. So um, we don't want to be naive or Pollyannish. Uh, we think there are things that can be done. Development uh, certainly helps. We have pretty strong evidence, at least across nationally, that um, uh, uh, that poverty is associated with more of these kinds of activities, um, and where we see these. 
being less robust are, are tend to be in urban areas where there are uh, more diverse economies and alternatives, alternative networks to which voters can turn. Um, but uh, uh, but yeah, it's 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 an ongoing process, uh, and it's not. And again, we want something we want to stress. It's not unique to these countries. This, this, these kinds of activities are ubiquitous around the world uh, and didn't disappear in places like the United States or uh, or Sweden or Britain until quite late in the process. So they, it took them 200 years, may take these countries a little longer as well. I'm not sure I'd even go that far. <laughs> disappear after 100 years? Where? Well, the cash, the cash, the, the cash giving maybe. Okay. Um, I'd love to open it up for questions and uh, People who are online. Ah, we have one. So I can read it, but it's from someone named Eric White. Thank you for writing in. In your presentation, you explicitly conceptualize and analyze types of patronage. But what about types of social networks? Is that worth paying analytic attention to and triangulating with types of patronage? I'm sorry, I, I, my eyesight isn't very good. Um, just somebody, for example, one could think about the qualitative features of networks such as you uh, I can't remember. reference to networks of affect versus networks of benefit or the morphological features of networks such as their comparative size, scale size, density, intensity of interaction, structural holes, etc. Um, so I'll, I'll start off the answer but so we do look very much at so the our idea of electoral mobilization regimes take the types of patronage and the types of networks and see how those align and so I'll, I'll start with that and then I'll let somebody else take over. Yeah, so I would say, um, and Alan might want to come in on this as well, that one of the key, uh, or a couple of the key features of networks that we compare are their degree of permanence. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a really major distinction that we see between across the three uh, cases, because this obviously affects things like the, um, you know, the degree to which individuals see themselves building long-term political careers through these networks very possible in Philippines, in Malaysia, um, uh, can be, can occur in the Philippines, much less likely in the Indonesian case where you have these very ephemeral uh, sort of machines. The other feature we, and one other feature we examine quite a bit, uh, is the extent to which these networks are able to function uh, in the coordination and distribution of patronage. Again, we see a lot of that coordinating role being played uh, through uh, parties in Malaysia and to some extent um, in uh, in the Philippines where subordinate uh, candidates who are running through these network forms are able to access patronage either provided by the national party state or by the head of the local machine in the Philippines. But in the Indonesian case, they're largely on their own. Everyone has to pretty much raise their own funding uh, and their own, team, um, their own team. So that's a couple of dimensions which we do discuss quite a bit in terms of comparing nature of network. The only thing. Oh, go ahead, Paul. Go ahead, Alan. Oh, just, uh, just really, really easy, uh, specifically on the issue of social networks. Yeah, we, we, we look at um, the nature of those networks and find this sort of transition from, as, as Ed, Ed mentioned, that these networks have effects um, uh, um, sort of based on. Um, uh, social ties to networks of benefits, so based around sort of uh, political networks uh, over time. The other dimension we look at quite closely is, uh, again, how cohesive uh, and command driven these networks are. So politicians often behave as if, at least hope that these that these networks are are these command networks where they can go to the leader and negotiate a one one time payment and those leaders can deliver the vote. What we found is that um, time and again they overestimate the the ability of, of those leaders to deliver and that those that those kinds of networks are increasingly rare where you have uh, that hierarchy and that cohesiveness. Those networks have, have just become much weaker, much less prevalent as a result of uh, of development. And then I guess the last thing I'll note I'll note on the the social networks is. One of the things we wanted going to this project is whether these 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 alternative networks would be um, complements to or alternatives to patronage networks. And what we found um, generally is these networks just get sucked up in and brought in under these patronage networks. So if it's a you know if it's an ethnic network or religious network, they just become uh, part of the patronage machine. They're, that that's that's one chunk of your brokers are you know are the members of your religious community and they're working on your behalf, but they don't supplant or substitute for these patronage networks for the most part. And did you want to add something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think I'll alternate room and um, online and 
Board Berenshot, I'm so glad you're, you're here with us uh, online. But Duncan McCargo's in the room, so I'm going to turn to him with a question, and then we'll go to you, Ward. Thanks a lot. And I, Alan and I did a podcast about uh, some of their this book a while back, so it's great to see the book out. All four of you here, or virtually here. Okay. Uh, I have a kind of methodological question, which is not about how you did the research, which I think I understand. Four people write a book together. <laughs> uh, I've co-authored books, I've co-authored articles, but four people writing one book, that's something I've never, that's a space I've never got into. Maybe we just talk about the collective process of producing a book as a, a team. We had a series of writing workshops where we would uh, get together for a week or two in uh, usually one large room around a big table or with different desks. Um, Actually, now that I think of it, as the project moved on, we tended to be a little bit further apart, perhaps so we couldn't quite so readily throttle. Um, and we just sort of each we each started by drafting certain chapters, and then we would swap, and then doing that again, and then periodically we'd stop to hash out an idea, um, sometimes contentiously, and mostly it just took like three times as long as writing a book. <laughs> so yeah, it just took a really really long time. That that's the main thing. So yeah. does that mean you don't highly recommend it? <laughs> Does anybody else want to talk about <laughs> the book with three other authors? Well, uh, <laughs> let me try to try, try to speak on the on the positive side. Okay, uh, okay. <laughs> certainly, there are um, just a, a range of different perspectives that that come in, and that um, allows for. Uh, uh, us to pick up on uh, each other's foundational work and, and add to it. And um, I think that the overall yeah. pro uh, product, there, therefore, does reflect all of our uh, different perspectives on things. And that you know, overall, uh, it was a uh, complementary process, but uh, you know, certainly not, not without. I think the word contention came through. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, that was that's the more positive side of it, but then, yeah, not without some challenges as well. So I this will shock my colleagues to know that I'll be the positive one on the uh, on, on the call. But um, uh, this is a book, at least speaking for myself, that, that I couldn't have written myself. Um, uh, that really required the four of us in the you know in the room physically and and virtually. Uh, and we disagreed about a lot of things. Uh, and generally, we were able to resolve those, you know, um, uh, you know, come to come to some, uh, you know, we, we learn from each other. So, you know, sort of steel sharpens steel, you know, as we as we as we try to get our head around these things. And and um, so it, the transactions costs were were no question higher um, uh, than they would have been if we were just writing with one or two of us. Uh, but I think the quality of the book uh, would have been less under those circumstances as well. So. Uh, you know, I think we're proud of what we've been able to produce, and it, it is a collective effort, something we couldn't have done, at least, again, speaking for myself, uh, couldn't have done on our own. Great. So I'm going to read Ward's question, I hope, uh, and I see we have another question from another person. John Seidel has joined us, which is great. Uh, so Ward writes, congrats on this impressive book, its methods and materials, as well as the art of the impressive. My question concerns future trajectories of these regimes. Which one is more likely to evolve into a more or less clientelistic and more programmatic uh, form, and why? I'll just try. Do you want to start, Alan? You're you're muted over there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, you know, you, we think about sort of. Um, Progression to less uh, to more programmatic, less clientelistic. But there's also we want to acknowledge possibly to go the other way. So I'm kind of worried about Malaysia um, backtracking a little bit as as uh, um, as, as the party system weakens there. Um, I think probably um, uh, we sort of if, if we sort of look at in Thailand, the Philippines. I don't know if I'd say one is more or less likely. I could the more more. I would say where 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 are the sort of locus of innovation and new sort of patterns of politics emerging. So where we see these are sort of urban urban cores, urban centers, where sort of a new style of politics, whether it's reformist governors in uh, in Indonesia or uh, sort of uh, reformist mayors in uh, in the Philippines, uh, that's where we see sort of new models being uh, being presented. But it's a massive coordination problem, right? It's uh, um, 
uh, one of the things we're looking at very closely in the Philippines is whether these things can last in, in a place like Naga City, right? And the sort of pressures to kind of revert to the mean uh, over time. So not a, not a great answer to the question. I don't think, I, I wouldn't put money on any of them to be, um, you know, who, who's first over that finish line. But uh, I think we know where to look and where these things are likely to, to sort of emerge from. I don't know. I have, oh, sorry, go on. Well, one thing I would say is that over time, I would... I would think that the transition to less clientelistic politics requires the presence of strong national parties. Now, Malaysia shows that you can have a strong national party for a long, long time with agendas <coughs> politics. But to the extent that, that those parties are a, a necessary condition of programmatic politics, Malaysia still represents the strongest candidate for a transition away from clientelism, probably followed by Indonesia, although that that seems a long way away uh, to me, and then perhaps the Philippines lagging a little behind. But that's that's an off the cut. And nice to hear a question from Ward, who was my long term collaborator and for whom indirectly contributed a lot of ideas that form part of the backdrop of this. Thank you, Ward. So I'll actually push back against that just very briefly, which is to say that um, I think in in the way that we approach this within the volume, we we look at the focus for change really at the local level. So these, you know, mayors, for instance, will introduce a more programmatic politic as, and this, this aligns with work um, on, you know, Kanchan Chandra's work on India, for instance, of looking at the ways in which urbanization tends to reduce the pressures for clientelism and patronage and increase the pressures for reliable programmatic policies. And we find something similar in Malaysia is over 70% uh, urban and indeed, uh, even in Indonesia and Jakarta, for instance, we see less micro particulars and then we do in less urban areas. Um, and from that's also just density and number of people and you know the, the disruption of, of long seated networks. And yet I think the most recent Malaysian election shows the extent to which that local level innovation and change is not sufficient. So there we have just a weakening of party um, differentiation um, and an increasingly personalistic appeal by so many candidates, which for many of us who work on Malaysia raises the specter of a possible shift towards a more Filipino or Indonesia like personalistic voting, actually probably closer to Indonesia because there isn't yet the sense of there is a sort of warlord politics of its own form in Malaysia, but it's not not the same as the local machines in the Philippines yet. Um, so that, so there are these different countervailing directions of change. I would I would just uh, bring back uh, one one of the main elements that we address when we raise the question of well what brings change. Uh, and we went over that uh, a bit in the talk, but uh, we give a lot of attention yeah. to the potential for electoral system reform, um, uh, along with uh, strengthening bureaucratic co uh, coherence, limiting politicians' discretion, campaign finance reform, uh, and uh, reducing uh, vulnerability. Now, uh, electoral system reform can be one of the most promising ways of bringing about uh, change, and we know from experience that uh, looking at various experiences that uh, small tweaks in an electoral system can lead to very important shifts in how politics is done. So uh, we have one positive uh, case that we focus on in the conclusion, and that's uh, Japan's electoral system reform in 1994. And then the negative case that Ed has written a good deal about in Indonesia, the shift from a uh, closed list to an open list uh, proportional representation system, which from the outside looks like a small uh, difference, but um, for those who uh, are focused on, you know, the, the broad difference between party versus candidate-centric electoral systems, it's it's huge. Um, so um, we, we know that those things can bring about change, but uh, it also, uh, electoral system reform has its own historical baggage. It can be very, very difficult to, uh, to, to bring about, um, but I think we could focus on uh, that plus, plus of course, the uh, shifts in uh, Thailand that came about from the 1997 constitution and uh, how there was a, a more party-centric element, more, more uh, programmatic uh, element of politics that came in uh, at the beginning of this century. And it took a military coup, really, to kind of uh, to, to smash it down and to, uh, to weaken those, those parties again, particularly uh, uh, Thaksin's party. So... Um, I, I, you know, it's not it's not that we can look at really clear trajectories, Ward, um, uh, across all cases, but we can, by looking at specific cases, uh, understand that there are 
occasional opportunities for change and that those with uh, a desire to bring about reform to improve, improve the quality of, of democracy uh, can look to those as examples and uh, um, draw some inspiration from them and also uh, understand that it's not always a magic bullet. There can be some very negative electoral system reforms and uh, Indonesia sort of exhibit A in that regard. Great. Thank you. So we have another question from the room. Uh, Bob is from Bob. Thailand. Uh, he's here on a fellowship looking at democracy. Um, yeah. Hi. Uh, I was a computer campaigner in Thailand. Uh, I worked with Mr. Shashat for, as a communication director for, for his campaign last year. Uh, my, my question is more similar to, to what, uh, but, but to be more uh, specific. I would like to know that whether all these practices, you know, paternalism, paternalism, are these intergenerational? Will this continue when the new generation of voters become like more prominent in the electoral district? Yeah. And I might add, there's not much looking at the digital life of politics. Um, so yeah. with this next generation, that's a that's an issue. So yeah. I mean, I think, so some of that varies by place and by the, the so, and, and actually, if you look at, so for instance, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about M Malaysia. So we do find that, for instance, um, in rural areas, we find the same sorts of politics that tend to prevail. And some of that is because if you have, for instance, agricultural families who rely upon agricultural inputs from UMNO, from the United Malays National Organization, as is the case, there we find that younger voters tend to remain loyal, again, setting aside the most recent election, that's messing up everything <laughs> for conclusions on which. We'll just pretend that didn't happen. So up until that point, um, we found that younger voters who lived in states like Perlis, which is highly agricultural, still tended to vote BN because they rely upon this party, on um, no, its coalition, for agricultural inputs that come their member of parliament that they assume are not state-based. But this is, again, a macro project for some credit claiming or it's the, the plug list. And so in that sense, we do have an intergenerational pattern of the clientless network through which patronage is distributed. Um, where we have shift is often, and, and the rise of a more programmatic politics has to do with those voters who move, for instance, to the Klang Valley in Central Malaysia, from East Malaysia or the East Coast of Malaysia, who then are part of you know, these digital networks where they get information online rather than from like, their families or from their local area. They then go home to vote and bring those attitudes back. So some of the rise in Pakistan, for instance, in different areas in Malaysia was widely attributed to these outstation voters, you know, Malaysian term always for those who work out and work from elsewhere and then all the come from go home to vote. And so in that sense, we do find if you're in the same networks, if you haven't moved, removed yourself from them, they often persist and certainly find this in the Philippines. But as you have more internal mobility, those patterns are disrupted that's the, that, that's where we really get back to this question about the clientless network rather than the patronage itself. It's it's from whom do you get your information and to whom do you feel some sort of connection connection or reliance. We have two more questions, but does anybody want to add anything on the generational? But pattern? just 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 that you know if we, if we look at um, uh, contemporary Thai politics um, or yeah. South Korean politics, we. we we know that you need to take generational change very seriously, um, but um, I think the, the Philippines adds a good cautionary note on all of that um, because for years there's always been, I mean, going back to the 50s and then the 90s, I mean, name it, there can be uh, a sense that, oh, this is a different generation of, of politicians that come, uh, is coming forth. There were the Spice Boys in the 90s that were supposed to be new and, and innovative, and they just turned out to be... Uh, Patient and politicians like like everybody else. So it's also very easy for um, new generations to get uh, completely absorbed into the old uh, system uh, as well. And uh, you also have the the uh, authoritarian amnesia that's going on in the Philippines with you know, huge support for um, Ferdinand uh, Marcos Jr. from the youth. Um, so um, I'm I'm not someone that necessarily takes face value. Oh, the youth is a great hope. Um, maybe it is, but no. <laughs> maybe just on the digital thing, very briefly, we just to say we encountered a lot of, I mean, this digital campaign is, is changing very rapidly. So probably what's happening now is even different to 
what was happening when we were conducting our research a few years ago. But at that point, at least, we did encounter quite a lot of candidates, at least I'm thinking in Indonesia, who had a, who sort of differentiated their campaign strategy. So they would often have a digital campaign that targeted primarily middle class voters, where they would do the retail patronage in poorer districts or parts of their constituents. Yeah. Okay, so I can't read. John Seidel, hello. Your question is quite long and my eyes are terrible. Please. <laughs> uh, thank you, John. Great, great uh, set of questions. Um, and I will read it. First, the book refers to political machines, a term which is usually taken to refer to an entrenched and enduring form of local power which persists over time. How should we understand and explain the very prevalence and forms of such forms of local power and their varying roles in electoral mobilization across the three countries covered in the book. Uh, secondly, um, the book takes as its point of departure an interest in money politics, but there's virtually no reference to private business activities, interests, and involvement in elections. Readers of the book unfamiliar with these countries might be excused for coming away with, from the book with the impression that politics in these countries operates entirely autonomously from local and national business Whereas readers familiar with these countries know very well that politics and business, politicians and business persons are <laughs> intimately intertwined and at times one and the same at all levels of the political game. Why no attention to the role of business? Can I ask for the second question? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, so, um, uh, John, uh, uh, that's a very, very important uh, question, maybe one that we should have highlighted uh, as we go along. Uh, the book does give far less attention to the supply of, of patronage uh, and what uh, 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 entwinement there is with uh, business interests. We are much more interested in uh, how uh, patronage is dispersed. Uh, uh, Ed uh, said early on in the project, uh, we can probably take all this to retirement because maybe the next um, project could look at the supply of patronage and these relationships that, that exist. And we, we fully understand and certainly uh, draw inspiration from your, your own work on uh, how uh, politicians are can be deeply enmeshed in uh, illicit activities, whether uh, drugs or smuggling or prostitution, uh, you name it. Uh, use all of these things to get their um, patronage resources. And that's why we said at the outset when we define patronage primarily but not entirely from public sources. We fully understand that uh, a successful politician may have a really good uh, uh, gun running, um, drug uh, trafficking, uh, uh, sex trafficking operation on the sidelines that provides resources for, uh, for patronage. Um, but that is not our focus. And when our researchers went out, uh, they were more uh, taking snapshots of the uh, electoral dynamics in their area. We weren't asking them if they went off to, uh, uh, say, uh, Lano del Sur to give us the full political economy of that area and where the money is coming from with the Maranao traders and, and uh, all of their involvement. So we fully understand that there is an entirely uh, distinct dimension and we would, I think, I would uh, think my co-authors would, would agree. We do have uh, full agreement on some things, Duncan. I think we'd agree that that would be a project uh, right. for, for, for another book. Right. And we so, had some pressure to, to address that. We, we looked at it to the extent we could in yeah. passing, but it really wasn't our major focus. But, well, and I would add as well that part of the reason is precisely because, as John notes in his question, that this is already very well understood in the literature. And if we'd made uh, the relations with business, and we do certainly cover this topic uh, briefly in the book, but had that been another a major focus of the book, and it, then the book would be yet another analysis of the oligarchic nature of politics in Indonesia, the Philippines, and so on. Yeah, I feel the contribution would not have been so original. We wanted to do something new, uh, comparing patterns of distribution in the book, um, and as Paul says, a study of um, uh, campaign financing, the relations between business and uh, politics and so on, is perhaps a, a, a project for a later date. I see that we have a, quite a number of questions waiting. I'll say, in terms of John's first question, that, that's really, that's actually the core of the book. So I'm, I'm, I'm not, I might be missing something of, is that that's really what we're, that's our idea of electoral mobilization regimes is how enduring are these networks, 
where are they, you know, and, on what are they based? Are they from the party? Are they from families and so forth? Is really the, the essence. Okay, so we have three more questions, uh, but I don't want to cut you off. And then, and Alan, do you want to say anything about uh, Don Seidel's question? No, I'm, I, I, I agree with my co-author, so. Okay, <laughs> so um, do you think we should try to go through all of these and you... you I can give a very quick answer to Natina. So we had um, a part of, because it's important in terms of how we did the, the field research, all of those 50 or 60 researchers that we had for each country, we did a series of research trainings in which we had an interview protocol that they used. We had a set of questions, a form that they would fill out for a campaign event, state observe, and so forth, to try to make sure that we had a level of comparability and we trained them on how to do interviews as well as research ethics and so forth. So um, that was really the, the core there. And then they, they wrote up those, um, their, their interviews, we drew some quotes. Um, and then where possible, just in terms of the way that we worked with those data, which I think was, was for us an important decision as well. We had those edited volumes that you saw um, for, for each of the countries. So where possible, rather than go back to the raw data, we, we cited our authors. So it was their interpretation and analysis of the, of the results after we had workshopped each of those books, which also just helped us to, you know, give them citations also. Um, so, I just asked, and everybody can see these questions online. So let's just answer them. Uh, we're running out of time. Yeah. Oh, um, okay. So Alan? Yeah, Alan. Alan. Oh, okay. Well, uh, do you want to do Trisha's then? Um, uh, so she's asked, she asked, does the book make an attempt to compare between these regimes and other non patronage clientelist types of governments? I'm asking because I'm interested in whether you think macro particularism or credit claiming or facilitation are specific practices of these types of electoral authoritarian regimes. Uh, do parties that are more programmatic in nature not engage in credit claiming facilitation? Yeah, so um, I want to emphasize that, that we picked these three because they were, you know, so, uh, you know Indonesia and, and the Philippines are on the sort of democratic side of that, uh, that divide, Malaysia on the sort of authoritarian, uh, uh, authoritarian electoralist regime. Um, uh, but yeah, we do talk about in that chapter how the you know credit claiming and facilitation, or you could call it constituency services, sort of the bread and butter of politics. Um, that happens. Uh, that happens. Uh, that's what we expect politicians to do. Uh, that's why one of the, we we think that's less um, that that's that's more innocuous than the sort of morsalization in terms of its effects. Uh, but the sort of the, the twist is not just um, hey, I, in a general sense, I was here as your representative working on your behalf, and I'm cutting the bridge open. But it's the it's the desire to take the extra step to impute to try and impute. Um, uh, that you are directly involved without my involvement, this would not have occurred. That's the step that that I think moves this from sort of standard credit claiming to um, uh, to implied contingency. So um, yeah, go ahead, Mary. Reading the book, and I think this made it into a footnote. Donald Trump signed those checks for COVID relief, right. and so we like we wanted to use that as a sign. Like, no, it's not just these states. That's, that's our point. Is that this is a framework that applies all sorts of places of like pretending that Donald Trump was giving you that money. His signature has no value on that check. <laughs> <laughs> so there's Victoria, and then there's a new image. Yeah. Oh, I can just briefly for Natina. Um, so I actually have there's another spin-off book from this project, which is my own one on risk resilience. So I actually find that in, in Singapore, for instance, we do have a very similar um, reliance upon it, just more disguised in some ways or less um less recognized because of the lack of party variation. But um, but yeah, I, I find that actually Singapore politics is very much the same sort of clientelistic credit claiming macro particularism that we find in Malaysia. And we expected that Thailand was going to be part of this book and we expected Thailand to look similar, although with some interesting changes in Thailand over time in terms of individual versus party based uh, patronage. Uh, and Cambodia, again, we did it wasn't part of the book, but um, you know, lots of patronage there funnel off and through the party as well. So yeah. One, go ahead. one of the interesting contrasts we do cover briefly in the book is between Indonesia and Timor Leste, where you can really see the impact of different uh, electoral systems. If you go across the border uh, between West and East Timor, you'll just find this really very different form of electoral campaigning in East Timor, very party focused. Uh, um, uh, much more programmatic campaigning uh, in the Indonesian side of the board in this very individual, individuated, fragmented system of campaigning um, with um, distribution of um, individual gifts to voters at election time. And it's really 
part, partly, of course, due to the different historical legacies, the role of, um, you know, the independence struggle and so on, and the lingering leg legacy of that in the Timorese party system, but partly it's a, the difference between a, a closed and open party list within Indonesia, candidates from the same parties competing against each other for the, for the support of the same voters and therefore uh, differentiating themselves from candidates from their own party by distributing benefits to individual voters. And in some ways, I get that Victoria's question uh, that it's not just a question of being democratic or not democratic in the elections, but really much more fine-grained questions of institutional rules and electoral rules specifically. And uh, we would very much acknowledge that those patronage practices have been very important in authoritarian regimes, uh, extremely important in Suharto's Indonesia and Marcos's Philippines. Uh, and um, let's not forget most recently in, in Thailand, the, uh, the generals have, as I understand, uh, found it useful to be doling out lots of patronage and to be restricting the patronage uh, dole outs of the uh, opposition. So uh, all of this can be, these are very valuable tools in authoritarian settings, electoral authoritarian settings as well. So I actually have a really quick question. If you had to rank disillusionment um, <laughs> in uh, with the whole regime of voting in the electoral systems and democracy for your countries that you studied, what, what would you say? And then we have to well, say. Malaysia still has really high turnout, even when I expected, as did many, that the turnout would be the last election much lower than it was. People were predicting the 60 to 70 percent range, and it was something like 75 or so, even despite the, you know, just collapse of governments and all that. So I think there's still a high degree of faith in elections in Malaysia. I would put that probably at the top in terms of illusionment, not, not disillusionment, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then after that. In, in the Philippines, patronage politics is just seen as far as politics. politics. It's, it's very not. difficult to imagine politics um, without all of this. These patterns mm -hmm. go back uh, uh, a century uh, into the American mm -hmm. colonial period. The, the pork barrel is, uh, just celebrated its 100th anniversary uh, <laughs> a couple of years ago. So these, these patterns are just seen as part and parcel of politics. You get very high turnout in the Philippines. It doesn't mean that people are, are pleased with the system, but it's uh, difficult to imagine a different one. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of ambivalence. So people hold contradictory attitudes often at the same time. They'll right. say, oh, these politicians are, are terrible. They use money in politics. Well, well, do you take money from? Yeah, of course I do. It's our opportunity to make money from these banks. You know, that's the... But in Indonesia, you do see the gold put campaigns and things like that. So there might be somewhat higher disillusionment in Indonesia than in maybe than the other countries. Very high turnout, high levels yeah, of death. I mean, that's, that's, yeah, that's kind of the perverse aspect of this in some ways is that people still vote and that we, again, we didn't find much evidence that many of these practices de definitively will change votes, for instance, in Indonesia. Alan, do you have a very briefly, then sorry, I have to slip out for class. But the um, I think there's, there's there's this bigger tension between every if you you poll people, almost everybody loves democracy. If you start asking them serious questions, they're all deeply dissatisfied with the democracy they have, and these practices are part of this. Um, uh, they they recognize most voters recognize systemically this is a bad idea, but um, uh, individually it's a it's a good idea to partake, you know to to, to get to get in on this stuff. Uh, and uh, they realize democracy is underperforming, and this is again, this is part of part of the problem and part of the challenge in places like the Philippines and Indonesia. Why people are willing to vote for Duterte or Prabowo or others who um, can can promise or, or, or promise to to try and shake up the system in interesting ways. So, thank you, thank all four of you so much. It was a really interesting conversation, and it's clear that there's another book if you guys can do it. <laughs> thank you very much.